Excellent. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much, Tanya. Thank you to John. I know a lot of work went into setting up this program. So hopefully um, it, it brings some positive attention to uh, the industry and uh, coming off a very strong 2021. I think uh, the timing couldn't be better. Um, so I'm going to give just a, a brief overview. I'll talk about the supply, the demand, uh, fundamentals of the industry, maybe talk about prices a little bit, and then we'll leave some, uh, some time for uh, Q&A. So I guess uh, just, you know, maybe first touching on the, the elephant in the room, um, the impact of sanctions on Russian diamonds. This is a, a big deal. I think it's going to fundamentally change the industry. Uh, Russia accounts for, you know, upwards of a third of, of global diamond production by volume. Um, so this is a, this is a big deal. Um, and just maybe to kind of uh, tune anybody in that's not, you know, very familiar with the details. It started in late February, the uh, U.S. Um, imposed sanctions primarily targeting uh, El Rosa, the large Russian diamond producer and uh, related investment in that company. And then in March, um, the, the, the sanctions escalated to uh, cover, um, you know, Russian rough and polished diamonds. Um, however, this did not cover Russian diamonds that are uh, manufactured or cut and polished outside of Russia and sold outside of Russia. Um, so you may have heard, um, you know, some of the, the, the dialogue surrounding that and the implication on that and the nuances around that. Um, and then uh, most recently, El Rosa was placed on the SDN uh, list here in the US and that essentially prohibits um, Americans from doing any sort of business with El Rosa or any of its uh, subsidiaries. And then there's been kind of secondary effects, um, given that, you know, diamonds are typically traded in US dollars, um, you know, you know, other uh, secondary uh, sanctions have really made it difficult to transact uh, Russian diamonds in, in US dollars. And, um, you know, in, in recent weeks, I would say since kind of the end of uh, May, most of, 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 the, of the traditionally scheduled Russian diamond um, sales and, and, and contract tenders um, have effectively stopped. Um, there are some, you know, private one-off, you know, transactions that are happening, but um, most of that regular flow of, of Russian goods has stopped um, in, in, in recent weeks, and it's unclear when, when that flow is going to reopen. Um, and, I, you know, I, when we kind of look at how this is impacting the supply chain, um, the manufacturers uh, uh, are, are, are towards the front end of the, the supply chain. So we're primarily talking about the, the, the companies that buy rough diamonds and they cut and polish those diamonds. A lot of that business takes place in India. Um, and uh, there, there's you know, many companies in that segment of the supply chain that are having um, difficulty getting sufficient supply of rough diamonds. And, and there are shortages noted. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of these manufacturers have to cut worker hours, cut, cut the work week. So they're, they're working through this difficult time right now. Um, as far as kind of the downstream and the retailers, I think it really hasn't been felt, uh, you know, by that segment yet. Um, you know, the, the supply chain, you know, usually takes, you know, say three to six months to get a diamond that's, that's mined to the consumer. So I think as we get towards the second half of this year, uh, the impact of this supply disruption will be felt throughout the whole supply chain. And then I just uh, have a uh, a, a chart here that I thought would be interesting. Um, this is basically showing goods that are primarily produced in, in, in Russia. And they're the kind of the smaller, medium-sized, gen near quality goods. Um, and since the sanctions were implemented, this category of goods has outperformed. And this is uh, kind of the idea of this chart. This chart goes back to a uh, starting point of October, 2021, but you'll see kind of when you see that the pink shading, that's when the, the, the sanctions were implemented. Um, and all of these um, no, you know, noted categories have outperformed on a relative basis. The, the dark line is the consolidated or the overall market. So I think this is showing that, um, that the sanctions are directly impacting certain categories of goods. Uh, so now if we kind of take a step back and just kind of look at the, the longer term, um, you know, diamond mine supply, you know, fundamental situation, I think just to kind of give a, a quick overview that the market was oversupplied for most of last decade. Um, I think that's kind of put, you know, what put a ceiling on prices most of last decade. Um, and, and I would say the most recent high watermark in production was 20, you know, 2017, 2018. Um, and since then, there's been incremental decreases in supply. And I think this is as simple as 
you know, prices weren't really strong enough to lead to new exploration development of new projects. Um, you know, legacy, uh, there's been multiple legacy mines that have reached the end of their life. So there really hasn't been a way to um, kind of add new production to offset the, the declining and the, the, the halted production of, of some of these older mines. Um, and because of that, we went from, um, you know, a, you know, a, a multi-year high in production in 2017 to a multi-decade low uh, in, in production that was kind of hit in 2020. Um, that was in part due to uh, production de delays related to the pandemic, but um, the longer term trend of, of lower supply was already intact. And um, going forward, I think um, we're gonna remain well off that, that 2017 high uh, in, in, in production for the foreseeable future, I would say for at least the, the rest of this decade. Um, and then I think if we just, you know, we also look at minor inventories, um, they're the lowest in years. There was definitely a shortage of goods, um, you know, late last year into early this year. Um, and then the sanctions kind of have further complicated that, that scenario. And then I would just note that uh, the Luashe mine in Angola, it's the Luli pipe. It, it's kind of what it's referred to as locally. Um, that uh, is the only major new uh, diamond mine that, that's, that, that's kind of being developed and, and expected to be put into production um, sometime this decade. Um, notably, Alrosa is one of the, the, the primary partners in that project. So kind of given the, the complications around, um, you know, how the sanctions are impacting that company, that could lead to delays of, of that project. So that's something uh, we want to keep an eye on closely. And this is the visual representation of kind of what I was just speaking out. So you'll see um, production hit an all time high, you know, around, you know, 2005. Um, and then kind of when the global financial crisis hit, 2008, 2009 production fell off. And then we kind of got that, uh, you know, that, that surge in, in supply and, um, you know, towards the end of last decade, there were multiple new mines that uh, commenced production. Um, and then the, the pandemic hit, and that's kind of when we got back to that multi-decade low. And, and going forward, I expect to be in that 110 to 130 million carat range uh, for, for most of uh, the remainder of this decade. And I, I thought uh, this is kind of interesting to look at. So when we look at where supplies, you know, going to come from, um, you know, and I would say that in, in the medium to longer term, it's continued investment, capital investment, in some of these legacy mines. And you have the, these, these tier one asset, these world-class diamond mines, they represent a significant, a small percentage of mines represent a significant portion of global output. And you continue to see significant investment uh, in, in these mines. A lot of them are listed here. Um, all of the, the mines listed here, except for two are, um, you know, le legacy mines where there's, you know, been significant investment and expansion. Um, again, there's just not a, a whole lot of brand new projects uh, coming online. So the core of production uh, is going to continue to be the, the, these older legacy mines. And you'll see uh, most of these investments have taken uh, production out, you know, you know, you know, over the next decade and some beyond that, but for the most part, we're going to need to, uh, you know, see significant capital uh, investment to even to even keep a lot of these mines going beyond 2030. Looking at the midstream, so again, these are the cutters and polishers. Most of this uh, takes place uh, in India. Um, when we looked at, you know, the oversupplied market for for a lot of last decade. Um, you know, you know, saw a similar phenomenon in this segment of the industry that the, 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 the midstream and the manufacturers, a lot of uh, them had excess supply that they accumulated uh, early last decade and through uh, mid, mid to end of last decade, um, you know, a lot of this supply came, came online and again, it kind of put a, a ceiling in diamond prices, you know, I would say the market was oversupplied, um, but there have been, uh, you know, fundamental um, re restructuring of, um, of that segment of the industry. Um, and it, it, it's, in a, it's in a lot healthier, uh, more stable place now because of that. Um, and you look at the way that, uh, say that the, you know, the beers and our roast are, are, are kind of working with their, their clients to try to make the supply chain more efficient. They're trying to allocate more goods towards, um, you know, manufacturers that add value that actually cut polish and, and sell the polish versus um, say, say the companies that are, you know, more interested in kind of trading or trying to flip or, uh, speculate on rough. And, um, and I, I think we're starting to see kind of the, the, the impact of these uh, changes play out. Um, the manufacturing segment of the industry is probably the most profitable that it's been 
in quite some time. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of see this on the next on, on the next page here. So this is uh, my estimation of uh, manufacturer inventory. It's a very difficult um, uh, area of the industry to, to analyze and to quantify, but this is kind of my, my best analysis of it. And that pink line, that, that pink highlight is kind of where I think the, the, the midstream inventory needs to be to, to kind of be in a healthy, um, you know, fundamentally balanced state. And um, you can kind of see middle of last decade, the market was oversupplied. And then, um, you know, towards the, uh, you know, kind of towards the end of, of last calendar year and early this calendar year, there was a lot of, you know, restocking following um, a, a very, very strong 2021. And, and the industry was fully stocked um, earlier this year. And then I think when we got into the, the situation in, in February with the sanctions and the, and the, the reduced supply, um, the market was already fully stocked. And I think that's why we didn't see, you know, a, a huge surge in, in, in diamond prices in February, March, April. Um, like maybe we saw with, with wheat and oil and some of the other commodities that were directly impacted um, by, by, by the circumstances. So um, I think now we're starting to see the, uh, the, 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 the impacts of that on supply. And I think that's why you're starting to see midstream inventories kind of fall back again down into that, that level where they're, where they're properly supplied. Looking at the demand side now, um, in, you know, when we look at global diamond jewelry demand, the market has been growing at a, I would say, a low to mid single digit percent rate for um, most of last decade. Um, you know, the pandemic hits and obviously it, it, it took a material hit uh, to global diamond jewelry demand. You know, jewelers around the world were closed. There was economic uncertainty. Um, however, um, I would say kind of starting in the second half of, of 2020 um, and into the, the holiday season, you know, Q4 2020. Um, diamond jewelry demand, you know, rebounded very, very strongly. And that, uh, of course, led to a record year in 2021. Um, and I think this was, you know, there, there were many reasons. There's always many reasons. But um, I think a lot of it had to do with uh, stimulus and consumers, you know, having um, money to spend that they weren't spending on travel or, or, or dining or, or other service related um, expenditure. So, um, People bought bought luxury. They bought they bought they bought hard luxury. They they bought diamonds. Um, diamonds did it did especially well, um, and that kind of you know kind of carried to calendar Q uh, Q1 2022. A lot of the jewelers uh, continued to see that momentum into early this year. Now we're getting into a, I, th I think a much more complicated macroeconomic situation. Um, you know all of this uh, liquidity and and all the stimulus that went into the global economy in 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, central banks around the world now have to rein that in. And uh, given that we have inflation at, at multi-decade highs, um, there, there's real pressure to do this more swiftly than, than in the past. And, and in the past, when central banks kind of would tighten uh, economic conditions, and if it was kind of spilling over to employment, um, you know, a lot of times you would see central banks kind of kind of uh, kind, kind of hold off on, on the tightening and, and kind of allow the economy some time to recover. This time is, is different because the inflation is a real problem and, and they don't really have the luxury of um, kind of kind of switching the, the policy narrative until inflation comes down. And I think that's why there's a lot of fear in, in the market right now. If we look at, you know, what, why the stock market has sold off so sharply. Um, it's interesting because kind of the, you look at the stock market and it's implying um, you know, an economic catastrophe. And I think when you talk to businesses, I think they're, they're, they are seeing some slowdown and there's concern that, uh, you know, the, the slowdown will accelerate and consumer sentiment is falling. But I, I think when you talk to businesses, I think the, the, the actual um, consumer environment is not nearly as bad as, as maybe the, the stock market's predicting. So we'll kind of see how this plays out. Um, but again, we do have a in, in usual macroeconomic backdrop, given that inflation is, is such a problem and, and, and given that um, central banks are tightening uh, economic policy, um, you know, while the, the, the economy is slowing. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of unusual circumstances from that standpoint. And that is going to spill over to diamond jewelry demand. We'll just, uh, we'll, we'll kind of see how severe that becomes. But right now, most uh, of the jewelers um, say they are seeing some slowdown, but um, um, probably not as, as, severe, as, as severe as you think it would be if you're watching the stock market. 
I think if we look at demand kind of longer term and, and kind of you know changes to um, to, to the to consumer demand, <clears throat> you know, right now the U.S. is the largest uh, diamond consumer, um, you know, diamond jewelry consumer in the world. Half of global diamond jewelry demand comes from the U.S. Um, the China is the largest, fastest growing market. <clears throat> at, it's probably approaching you know you know 15, 20, 25 percent. Um, India is a, a huge market with a lot of potential. India has a has has a billion people plus um, with with a penchant for luxury and and and, and jewelry and, and and they like natural diamonds. Um, and I think you know you know within the next decade, decade decade and a half, I think if you look at China and India combined, those two markets could actually outpace the U.S. That's kind of an interesting trend. Again, we kind of see U.S. as kind of the, the core consumer market, but you have China and India to a lesser extent right now being the fastest growing large market. So that's something you wanna keep an eye on. Um, and then I think just maybe looking at the way that, that, that kind of jewelers are modernizing and kind of changing how they, how they sell their product. Um, you know, a lot more companies are, are selling diamonds online and they're using the, the physical stores maybe a way to um, kind of market their brand and, and kind of immerse, you know, consumers in a brand um, and I think once, you know, the, the, the jewelers build that loyalty with consumers, um, a lot of these consumers are, are, are buying diamonds uh, and, and, and jewelry and other luxury items online, which kind of, you know, seemed unthinkable a decade, a decade and a half ago. Um, so you kind of call this an omni-channel strategy. And, and again, it's kind of integrating kind of, you know, virtual e-commerce with the physical store experience. And it's interesting because the traditional brick and mortar jewelers are, uh, you know, spending money investing on on, on online um, and, and 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 digital uh, you know distribution expansion, and then you have the the traditional online jewelers are actually doing the opposite. They're they're investing in physical brick and mortar stores. So it's kind of interesting to see how that how that plays out. And I think uh, this is I think one of the most interesting charts in the industry right now. This is Chow Tai Fook. That's the largest. Uh, uh, jewelry chain, the largest corporate jewelry chain in, in greater China. Um, and they're aggressively opening stores. They, they, they continue to, to see you know, major expansion potential in China. Um, and, and this chart just shows you how many new stores. Um, so all the way in the right, that red bar is the, the company's uh, fiscal year, which ended in March, 2022. And you could see that last year alone, they opened twice as many stores as they did in 2021, 2020, 2019, and kind of going all the way back, uh, you could just see the the the, the surge in, in, in new store openings and um, and they're opening stores in, in these smaller cities. But in China, a lot of these smaller cities still have a million plus people. So the the point being here is the growth potential in that in that Chinese market is you know continues to be very very exciting and uh, um, and it's going to be one of the major growth drivers for um, diamond jewelry demand going forward. Looking at, at maybe how all this is impacting prices, um, I, again, I, I think the market was oversupplied for a lot of last decade and that put a ceiling on prices. Um, you, know, you know, prices, you know, you know, did sell off obviously in 2020, there wasn't much of a market. Uh, the major miners really didn't make sales into the weak market. They kind of held and, and built inventory, which was the right thing to do because when demand surged in 2021, they were able to uh, kind of sell off that inventory in, in a much stronger yeah. market. And at a better price, and uh, and and diamond prices uh, it kind of reflected the demand that we saw in in, in twenty twenty one. And uh, according to my own Rep Diamond Index, you can kind of find a a link to that on the presentation. You can also navigate to it uh, from my website. But um, according to that consolidated index, rough prices made a a new all time high um, in in January of twenty twenty two, and that kind of took out the previous high, which was in the first half of 2011. Um, so that was kind of a significant milestone uh, for, for rough diamond prices and, and kind of for the index that tracks that. Um, and, and again, going forward, I think the, you know, the, the, in general, the supply uh, backdrop remains favorable for, for prices for I think the definitely kind of the short and, and the medium term. It's just a question of you know, what's gonna happen with demand and kind of the, the macroeconomic situation that, that, that I was talking about before. And then just, I think one other thing that that's worth noting is you look at, you know, inflation around the world. And obviously this is in fact, uh, in fact, impacting diamond mining 
companies as well. And, you know, they, they, they use fuel, they use diesel, labor prices are going up, consumable prices are going up. If you're doing any kind of construction or CapEx project, um, you know, costs associated with that are, that are up, you know, significantly in just, you know, recent months. So um, I, I think if anything, we're going to see support in diamond prices just because of inflation and the cost of produced diamonds is going up uh, with inflation. I think you're going to see that, um, you know, reflected in, in, in rough prices. This is a longer term uh, rough diamond price chart relative to inflation. So the dark line is the consolidated rough diamond index. That light gray line is, is in uh, US inflation. Um, and you can kind of see that you know, diamond prices have held up with inflation over the longer term, um, but it's kind of been a volatile ride, um, especially in that, that post 2005 uh, era. And maybe just a, a quick uh, few points here on man-made diamonds and how that's going to impact the natural diamond market. Um, you know, this is something you definitely want to want to keep an eye on. It's a new product. It's an exciting product for a lot of people in the industry. Um, a lot of consumers like it. It seems most consumers like it because of the lower price point. Um, I think as the product matures, we're going to continue to see the price of man-made diamonds fall, especially relative to natural diamonds. Um, I mean, you know, lab diamonds are a manufactured product. We, in theory, could produce as many as we want. The production technologies are improving. Um, and, and again, I think ultimately this is going to result in, in lower production costs of man-made diamonds and, and, and over, you know, overall lower prices of man-made diamonds. So I think when we see that, that price differentiation widen further, I think it's going to, you know, it, it's going to maybe change the way that the industry and consumers think of lab diamonds versus natural diamonds. And I think, you know, you know, at least in the medium and longer term, I think we're going to see most um, lab diamonds sold as, you know, lower price fashion jewelry that maybe competes less with uh, natural diamonds. And this is a, a table I put together of, you know, just a sampling of you know, large jewelry retailers in the world and, and whether or not they're selling lab diamonds now. And if they are selling lab diamonds now, are they marketing it as, as bridal jewelry? Um, so I think kind of what you see here is when you look at kind of maybe the low to medium tier companies that in the past have sold, um, you know, man-made ruby emerald sapphire or other man-made gems. They're also selling man-made diamonds. Um, but I think when you look at the real high-end jewelers, they um, you know, are, are, are not selling the product. And I think uh, when you kind of hear them talk about the product, they say their customers still want, you know, natural, natural uh, precious stones. Um, so um, it's kind of interesting to watch this evolve. I think that if we're looking at retailers, I think the most important thing going on right now is Pandora, which is a, a fashion jeweler. They have a global presence. They have like 6,500 stores. They have a big distribution channel. Um, within the last year, they announced they're going to launch a lab diamond uh, jewelry line. Um, and they said that they want to make diamonds available to everybody. They want to democratize diamonds. And I think that's kind of, um, I think, a proxy for what we're going to see, um, you know, for, for this industry going forward. I think you're going to see a, a lot of these uh, man-made diamonds marketed as a, a lower price alternative to natural diamonds, um, you know, perhaps targeting a different customer altogether. And, and just maybe just one more uh, kind, kind of thought on, on man-made diamonds and kind of looking at how supply uh, stands up to natural diamonds. So um, I think if we look at the man-made diamond jewelry market, man-made diamonds, you know, represented, you know, zero, you know, you know, nil, you know, almost none of the market, you know, five or six years ago. Today, I would say lab diamond jewelry, you know, represents a high single digit, maybe 10, even 11% of global uh, diamond jewelry demand. Um, so it's growing, it's growing rapidly. And, and again, I think as a product matures, I think the way it's, it's marketed and positioned is going to change. Um, it's going to continue to evolve. Um, but again, um, it's a segment of the market that that's growing quite quickly. And uh, the beers is involved now and they have their own um, lab diamond jewelry line. And then I think they're using that, uh, um, you know, as a strategic tool to try to uh, frame the product and in, in the way that they think it should be framed again, which is kind of more of a, a fashion jewelry, lower price product, um, linearly priced, meaning that the larger the diamond, it, it's still gonna sell for the, the same price uh, per, per carat. 
uh, versus a natural diamond where the, the price gets exponentially more expensive the, the larger it gets. And again, that's because of the, the, the distribution that, that nature provides versus the distribution of uh, the size distribution of a, of a lab diamond, which is uh, um, a manufactured product. And uh, I think this is the last uh, chart. So um, this is looking at lab diamond prices on relative uh, equivalent terms versus natural diamonds. Um, so you'll see on, on kind of the left side of the chart, you know, middle last decade, lab diamonds sold for maybe 10, 15% less than an equivalent natural diamond. Now you're kind of seeing them fall, you know, as much as 70, 80% less than an equivalent natural diamond. I think this is most apparent in, in the larger sizes. I think for the reason that I was uh, explaining before that with natural diamonds, the larger the size, they become accident, uh, exponentially rarer with uh, manufactured uh, diamonds, um, you know, to, to a certain extent, the, the grower and the producer can produce in the size that they want. Um, and I think this will get, uh, you know, easier and easier for them to do as the technologies continue to evolve. And I think that's uh, reflected in, in, in the prices here. Okay, the, uh, this is actually the, the last chart. So just maybe just a, a, a few points here on innovation uh, throughout the supply chain. You know, traditionally the diamond industry doesn't have a reputation for being uh, innovative. Um, but I think when you look at all segments of the, of the supply chain, you'll see that there is a lot of innovation happening. And you know, whether it's upstream with um, De Beers carbon capture, which is basically a way to crush Kimberley into small pieces with a lot of surface area and actually use that to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. You have uh, De Beers parent Anglo American is kind of leading the charge with hydrogen fueled uh, haul trucks. Um, you look at, you know, Tom and the XRT and, and, and some, some of the other companies that have uh, X-ray uh, transmission, which is reducing, um, I would say the waste and recovery. It's, uh, it, it, it's leading to, um, I would say the, the production of, of more larger diamonds because they aren't getting crushed in the recovery process. Um, so there's some really interesting things happening there. You have a whole lot happening with, you know, supply chain providence tracking and and, and trying to use the blockchain and some of these other technologies to track a diamond all the way from uh, the, the mine source and kind of provide that information to the consumer. And I think that solves a lot of problems uh, for this industry, um, you know, it, it, as far as providing customers with transparency that they need to feel comfortable buying a diamond. Um, and then downstream, I think I talked about some of this before, but just um, kind of changing the, 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 the consumer experience in store and kind of trying to integrate the online with the, uh, the, the physical footprint kind of bring the two together to give consumers what they want, which, which is, uh, you know, being able to research, you know, um, you know, a diamond online and then maybe come in, into the physical store to make the actual purchase. And that's, uh, I think the last slide I have, um, this is some information if you kind of want to track what I'm doing. Um, and with that, maybe I'll pass it back to uh, Tanya or John. I don't know if we have time for Q and A, but uh, whatever you guys want to do, uh, I'm happy to, uh, happy to stay on. Well, thanks very much. Paul. That was a fascinating view of the of the industry. Uh, we've got plenty of time for, for questions. So if you want to put your hand up, please do so. Um, if you are technically challenged, just open up your mic and ask a question. Or put something in the chat if you'd prefer to do so. Paul, maybe just to get the discussion going, I mean, with um, the Russian production now sort of being embargoed, and is it going to also be sort of absorbed or purchased by the Gokhran and kept by the, um, I guess, Russian finance department? Or, or what do you see happening there? Yeah, so there have been representatives come out and say that they kind of are looking at that as, as an alternative if they, you know, have a situation where they can't... Uh, uh, you know, sell goods into the market for the remainder of this year. Um, I think we've seen that in the past when there has been circumstances where, um, you know, they, they, they had difficulty selling goods, whether it was a global financial crisis, they considered it, you know, during the, the midst of the pandemic, they didn't go through with it. But I think they see that as kind of a backup plan. Um, mm -hmm. But I think longer term, I think what we're going to see is um, a segregation in supply in the market. So I think manufacturers are going to segregate, you know, Russian and non-Russian goods. And I think they're going to uh, send the non-Russian goods to their, their, their Western uh, clients um, that are requesting that. And then I think 
um, the Russian goods will probably end up in markets uh, like China, India, the Middle East, I, I, I think, uh, kind of maybe some of what we're seeing with kind of the flow of oil right now. Yeah. And, and your, your view on um, the Lucia deposit, I mean, is that um, a, a, a reasonably qu a good quality mine? I mean, there's not a, a whole lot of information out there, but it seems to have the right metrics. I mean, you were, you were in Angola last year, and what was your view on it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's certainly real. It's big. It's, it's world class in size. Um, Katosha, I mean, it, it's probably, you know, of, of similar, you know, scale to that. Um, mm -hmm. A similar grade and probably a, a relatively similar you know quality of diamond so i think at this point it's just a question of um getting it built and uh mm -hmm. and, and i think we know with with any kind of project that large it takes some time and there's the, there, there's always inevitable delays and i think now given that uh you know you know arosa is is the the major partner with ndiama in that project um you know there, there could be you know delays related to that so we'll just kind of have to wait and see but no, I mean, it's a significant supply catalyst for the industry. I think, uh, again, that's the only, you know, major project, um, you know, coming online this decade. And I think uh, the industry needs, you know, a, a significant source of new supply to offset the, the, the legacy mines that are reaching depletion. Absolutely. And I, I guess, Brooke, do you want to kick off? Um, when's your new discovery coming out of North America? Can't really talk about it. That's top secret stuff. But uh... Yeah, I had a, a follow on to John's uh, John's question. It, there are reports. Is there a lot of the Russian production is making its way to India? And have they started segregating the production yet? Because I know in the U.S., technically, people are allowed to purchase Russian diamonds that have been manufactured in India. But there's a real pushback to not want to do that by people like Tiffany. Do you have any more comments on how much? Russian production is making its way to India, or is that not really well known? Yeah, I, I would speculate that it's significantly less than you know, you know, what would make its way under normal conditions. Um, I think it's that the, the hangup is um, you know the transacting in, in, in U.S. dollars and, and and the difficulties around that because of the the larger broader sanctions, um, you know, by, by most of the West. Um, you know, is, you know, as far as kind of what this means from a, from a supply standpoint, uh, again, I think a lot of people thought diamond prices would kind of surge the way that we saw oil and, and, and maybe nat gas and, and, and wheat surge. Um, but, but again, I would, I would note that, you know, the, the industry, um, you know, you know, aggressively restocked in early 2022, kind of following that record 2021. Um, and, and the industry was was fully stocked, maybe overstocked, kind of, you know, getting into that February, February, March period. And I think that's maybe why we haven't seen diamond prices go yet. But again, I, I think when you look at the, the, the structure of the supply chain, there's kind of an inherent delay of maybe three to six months. So I think, um, you know, it, it will be felt more through the supply chain as we kind of go through this year. But again, the, the, the big variable is the demand side. And I think if we see um, you know, you know, you know, similar demand this year that we saw in 2021, there's going to be, I would say, significant, uh, you know, shortages of goods. But um, if, if the macroeconomic situation results uh, in a significant, dec you know, decrease in, in, in demand, I think that's going to kind of offset some of that, uh, that, um, you know, shortage of supply. Um, but uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see again, I, I think the most likely outcome is that uh, supply chains will be segregated. Um, and I think the industry has a technology to do that. They have the ability to do that. And I think when you look like you mentioned, you know, Tiffany and say Signet, that's the largest driller in the US and um, LVMH and Richmond. I mean, the, the, the major jewelers in the world, um, you know, have, have told their suppliers, we don't want, you know, you know, any goods of Russian origin. And I think those companies have a lot of leverage. And I think they're suppliers you know value that relationship and i think they kind of have to cater to them if they want to continue that relationship so that's kind of how i see this playing out uh you know at, at the moment thanks there's a, there's a question on the chat from michelle fanamova how would lab grown diamonds compare to or be affected by high quality simulants like moissanite especially as moissanite has become popular in its own right 
Right. And I think that's a, a really good question because we have seen, um, you know, similar e examples of this, you know, whether it was, you know, cubic zirconia or moissanite or white sapphire. I mean, this is different because it is chemically diamond. So it has all of the, you know, the, the, the great properties that that diamond has. Um, so much of this, I think, is going to ultimately come down to how the industry markets it and how the retailers present it to consumers. Um, and, and again, I think right now, when you look at the way that the jewelers are uh, presenting the product to consumers, that they're they're selling it as a as a lower you know price, um, you know, uh, a, equivalent of a natural diamond, which is ultimately what it is. Um, I think most consumers probably don't, um, you know, they, they probably can't distinguish between, you know, a moissanite and a, and a natural diamond and certainly can't distinguish between a lab diamond and a natural diamond. Um, so again, I, I think so much of this is going to depend on, you know, how does, how do the retailers market it? And I think it's ultimately in the retailer's hands. And I think when you look at it from a retailer standpoint and, and how they're going to see this strategically, I think, Again, it's a, it's a new product that maybe generates some newness and excitement for, for their store. Um, and there's certainly maybe some somewhat of a fad component, you know, attached to it. But I think longer term, if you're a retailer, there's a real risk that if you get to sell a consumer one diamond in their lifetime, do you want to sell a six, seven, eight thousand dollar natural diamond or do you want to sell a one or two thousand dollar lab diamond? And I think um, that's something that they're, that they're certainly considering. Um, and, and again, I think longer term, I think we're going to see companies like Pandora and these fashion jewelers do extremely well selling the product um, at a much different price point. And, and, and I think the product will be marketed uh, much differently um, than, than natural diamonds in general. I mean, there's certainly going to be lab diamond companies that have built, you know, really strong brands and maybe they're producing them with renewable energy and they're vertically integrated and in, say somewhere in the West and they're kind of kind of leveraging that. Uh, to sell it as a premium product. So I think those are the products that we'll see compete most with natural diamonds. But I think from a volume standpoint, um, we're going to see most lab diamonds sold as, as a, a much lower price, you know, fashion uh, jewelry alternative. Thank you. Uh, Katani has a question. Except for the pandemic, what are other causes that would make diamond prices to decline so rapidly? Um, so the, the pandemic at first uh, just hurt, you know, the, the, the global economy, obviously. Um, so that was that was a very in, unusual situation. I, I think when we look at um, diamond jewelry demand, it's, it's quite highly correlated with global GDP, especially I would say U.S. GDP, China GDP. Um, so it's correlated with the, the strength of the economy. I mean, people buy diamonds because they want them. They don't need them. Um, and when people feel good and consumer sentiment is high and they have discretionary capital, um, you know, that's when they'll buy diamonds. I would say engagement rings are maybe a little bit different, kind of, kind of, kind of given to the way that, given the way that that works. Um, but uh, I, I think we want to, we want to watch, uh, you know, consumer sentiment. We want to watch, um, you know, employment. We want to watch all the traditional macroeconomic factors. And uh, when the consumer is comfortable, you know, diamonds do, do, do well. I think diamonds did especially well in uh, 2021 again because you know they weren't competing with uh, you know the, the service industry and I think in times of emotional distress diamonds historically have done well so I think they benefited from that uh, people were giving meaningful gifts um, you know in, in 20 late 2020 and early you know 2021 I think that helped diamonds so it was kind of all the stars aligning for, for diamonds in, in, in 2021 and I think going forward it's going to be difficult to repeat that but I think the industry also got a lot of new consumers, maybe consumers that didn't consider diamonds in the past now had a good experience with it. So maybe they'll be kind of a, a, a sticky customer if, if the industry does the right thing. And, and just, extending from, just extending from that, Paul, I mean, what's driving the, the Chinese market? What are people buying there? Are they buying, you know, across the, the spectrum or are there sort of certain categories that they're pursuing? Yeah, so I think at, at first when we looked at, you know, maybe last decade, the, it seemed like the Chinese consumer wanted really high quality diamonds. I think as that market matures, that they're, they're maybe buying, you know, categories that are more similar to what you see in the U.S. where um, maybe they're, they're, they're favoring the size of the diamond over the quality. Um, but, 
it's such a, a, a large market and, and the consumers have a, a penchant for luxury there and, and, and they really like diamonds. And I think there's a huge opportunity. And again, that's why I showed that, tar that chart of Chow Tai Fook new store openings. I mean, it's really amazing when you look at yeah. the, the pace of new store openings there. And I think that kind of speaks for itself. You know, right now with, with the lockdowns in China and, you know, in, in early mid 2022, obviously that's um, kind of setting things, uh, you know, back at the moment, but I think that that's temporary in nature. Okay. Uh, Jean has got a, um, Jean Duplessis has got a question here with respect to the, the size of diamonds, um, comparing synthetic stones to natural diamonds. Would there be an increase in the, the size of synthetic stones that people are buying? Or is it pretty much the same? In another really good question. So I think what you're seeing from a production standpoint, um, five, six, seven years ago was the first time we saw a, a higher quality lab diamond that was say in excess of one carat polished. I think it was like 2015, 2016, a company called Genesis produced a uh, you know, a, a, I think it was like a 1.3 emerald, uh, 1.3 carat emerald diamond. And that was kind of the notable, the, the, the first, you know, you know, quote unquote, big, uh, you know, lab diamond that, that, that was produced. Now, I think you're seeing, um, you know, many companies have capabilities of producing three, four, even five carat polished uh, lab diamond goods. So I think to answer the question, it's the technology is advancing rapidly and more and more companies are able to produce larger goods. And again, I think one of the benefits of, of a lab diamond, if you're a consumer, is you could buy a, a, you know, a diamond that you wouldn't be able to afford if it was natural. And there's few people that could afford a four or five carat natural diamond. We're looking at, you know, obviously, a, you know, a six, you know, a six figure uh, purchase. Um, you know, if we're looking in US dollars, at least, you know, that, you know, $100,000 in excess uh, with the lab diamond, you know, you could buy a, you know, a, a three, four, five carat for, you know, in some cases under $10,000. So it's a completely different product from a, okay. from a pricing standpoint. And I think going forward, um, if consumers want larger goods, I think these producers will find ways to, to do it. What's interesting is you get to the point where the diamond's so big, consumers don't want that because it looks fake because it's so big. So it's kind of interesting. It seems like right now the sweet spot is at one and a half carat to three, four carat uh, polished is, is where consumers are, 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 are really, um, you know, buying uh, when it comes to the, the, the lab diamonds. Uh, Sean Johnson wants to continue on that vein. How do companies grade colored variants of diamonds? Are we able to synthesize lab diamonds similar to the, the ones such as the pink legacy diamonds? Uh, yeah, and, and this is interesting. Um, the answer is yes, they can produce pinks, blues. I would say, you know, at, at least based on what I've seen, the hues are different. Um, I think with the, the colorless diamonds, it's a, it's a lot more difficult to differentiate the natural in the lab. Um, but with the colors, the, the hues are different. It doesn't mean that they won't get to the point where they could produce a lab diamond that has a blue or pink hue that's you know, a lot more similar to a natural. Um, but I think when we look at from a marketing standpoint, uh, I, again, you know, kind of talking about you know, you know, how many consumers can afford a four or five carat natural diamond, you know, not a whole lot. And I think when we look at the pinks and the blues and the fancies, they're so extraordinarily expensive. Most consumers can't afford a, a natural pink or blue, um, but with a lab you know, diamond, they could. And I think when you look at you know, the way that some of these lab diamond producers are positioning their product, they're gonna focus on the colored stones because they don't have to compete with natural because the, the natural equivalents are, are so rare and so expensive. It's a completely different product. So I think we'll continue to see growth in the, in the color lab diamonds. Um, and, and again, I think that's a, a product category that competes very little with, with the natural industry. And, and I think a lot of, as you said early on, goes back to the brand, Paul, and, and you know, branding and young people wanting something different. Well, you know, that's the niche compared to, say, that, you know, the, the really expensive top end natural stones. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. There's one more here from Cameron. Are lab-grown or synthetic diamonds graded using the, the same grading methods as natural diamonds? 
Yeah. So I think there's the, the, the lab diamond producers definitely want that because they want to, you know, compete with natural diamonds as much as possible. I think they kind of want to ride on the coattails of the, 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 the decades or century of, of marketing that's gone into to natural diamonds. Um, I think the great institutions are, you know, providing that if enough people want it. We're seeing, I would say at this point, most of the major grading institutes do grade lab diamonds. Um, you know, I, I think they're trying to, uh, you know, do everything they, they, they can to try to differentiate at least uh, maybe the way that the certificates look. They want, I think the key to this whole thing is you do not want consumers to be confused. You do not want consumers just to think that natural are being swapped with lab. I think there's a lot of sensitivity around that. And this kind of fits into what the grading institutions are doing. I think the grading institutions are key here because, um, you know, they're the ones that can, you know, identify with certainty what's lab, what's natural. So they definitely have an important role. And then I think from a marketing standpoint, you know, you know, there, there, there are the producers want it and, and some consumers want a grading report um, and, and they're, they're providing that. So the answer to the question is, yes, they are, you know, you know, grading them on a similar scale in some cases. Um, but again, I think they're trying to be very careful to differentiate the way that the, you know, the, the two diamonds are being presented. So consumers don't, you know, feel that there's any confusion as to what's natural and what's, what's lab created. Something that struck me is that um, if sanctions continue for lo a long period and China and uh, India, for instance, um, uh, get a lot of their diamonds from Russia, um, won't that in the longer term impact on, on Western producers? So I, I think the the impact is going to be that I think there will be demand for um, you know, new non-Russian production. So the way I look at this is, you know, again, you know, you know, say we, we say Russian production by volume is, is 30% of global natural global diamond supply. The U.S. is half of global diamond demand. I think if we look at the West plus Japan, that's 75% of, you know, global and consumer diamond jewelry demand. So, um, you know, we definitely have a situation where the, the Western demand market is, is huge, it's significant. And if, if that market doesn't want Russian goods, we're gonna have you know, a, a shortage of goods, even if that 30% of Russian goods goes you know, to China and India. So, um, so, so I, I think there is definitely val validity to what you're saying. I think um, if anything, this, you know, the, the circumstances could be a catalyst for you know, new exploration and, and development of, of, of non-Russian projects in places like Africa and places like Canada places like Australia. Um, we'll kind of see if that, if that, if that plays out. Um, but I think that's definitely one of the, you know, the, the, the possible scenarios that result from this. Yeah, and I mean, it's an interesting point. If you listen carefully, sort of between the lines to Bruce Cleaver, he's been very, you know, circumspect, circumspect, but also quite bullish. You know, that the message coming out of Botswana is that it, it kind of suits them. And, you know, this is me paraphrasing. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens with places like Dumpshire, which I think is still mothballed, you know, whether that comes out of mothballs, because, you know, that still has capacity. And I would think probably, you know, turning up production at, at, at Arapa is, is, is definitely doable. So, you know, you, you probably got yourself a few jobs in Botswana to go and help them ramp up production. Yeah, well, I, I had that one uh, slide where I was showing the capital investment and, uh, and, yeah. and De Beers is fully committed. They have a lot of skin in the game. And I think Anglo has had a great 2021. So the parent company has the capital. I think uh, they like the diversification that diamonds bring to their, you know, say base metal uh, and, and other you know, commodity portfolio. Um, so I think as long as, um, you know, they remain committed, I think it's, it's definitely a good thing for the, for the larger industry. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing, don't forget the investment of beers and or Debs Marine and, um, um what's it, Namdeb, uh, Namdeb are putting into the marine production of, um, Namibia. I mean, that, you know, their new custom vessel, custom built vessel, what's it, Benguela, um, Gem, you know, is, a, is already... I think it was commissioned ahead of time and, and pumping diamonds. So I think um, there's probably, you know, some capacity in Namibia. I think Urban's on the call here. 
or on the talk and he's going to talk later in in the in the series from Debs Marine so it'll be interesting to see what he has to say on the situation as well yeah lower uh, lower volume I think you know it, it, it produces maybe a little bit over a million carats <clears throat> from from a volume standpoint yeah. but that uh, Deb Marine operation produces really really high quality um, um, you know, large gem gemstones uh, on an average price per carat basis. It, it, they're, they're worth a lot more than most of the other De Beers production. And you kind of have that natural filtration with the alluvial uh, deposits where the, the lower quality included diamonds don't make it through. So it's kind of a, yeah. it's kind of always interesting to, to, to kind of see that. Yeah. Lyndon, you have a question? Yes. Thanks, Tanya. I Paul. Uh, our alluvial production in South Africa is quite special. You know, we, we produce uh, large, high quality stones and, and large, I mean, often uh, in your monthly production, your, your high value is, is often with polish out a, a plus 10 carat stone, for example. How do you see the market for this type of stone in, in the mid and, and longer term? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think it's gonna continue to be well supported. Um, there, you know, the, the, those real large high end stones are really, really rare. Um, and I think you look at one of the, you know, the, 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 the impacts of the, the pandemic and, and the impact that had on the economy, on the global economy. And I think, you know, you know, I, I would say, unfortunately, one of the, the, the big economic takeaways from the last two years is even wider wealth, uh, separation in the world so that the wealthy the, the wealthy got even wealthier the poor got poorer um, but I mean as far as how this pertains to the, the, the diamond market um, you know that 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 wealthy consumer demographic um, is more equipped than ever to to buy you know high-end luxury items like really expensive diamonds and I think you're starting to see that uh, kind of reflected now in the market the high jewelers are doing you know you know really well they're say that uh you know, consumers are, are, are back out buying those really high end, you know, really exceptional diamonds and full force. So I think that, you know, segment of the market is going to continue to do well, kind of just given the, the global economic circumstances. And, and then I think from a supply standpoint, we just, we, I think anybody in the industry just can appreciate how rare that those real large goods are. Um, so there, there, there's, you know, you know, significant, you know, supply constraints. And then you have a, a situation where, that 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 real wealthy, um, you know, you know, consumer globally, um, you know, is continuing to grow, and I think that's going to continue to support the demand side. Yeah. And and Lyndon, um, I mean, you're probably aware that Paul's still waiting for his invite to actually come and see your businesses on on the Orange and Var River. So you know, you better get your symposium going for next year. Yeah, for sure. Next day or next year, it should be. Yeah, we're going to invite him. Great. Yeah, yeah it would be nice to see everybody in person again. Yeah. Okay. Unless there are any more questions, we have. Yeah, I see there's one from Quinton. Um, uh, Quinton, I mean, we 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 can answer that um, offline. Uh, you know, the the synthetic diamonds really started out in the industrial diamond production lines. So we forget that there's a huge international business of of synthetic um, diamonds used in all sorts of industrial applications. And Element 6, which is um, effectively a De Beers company, which now produces the Lightbox um, brand that Paul talked about, is, is you know, one of the world's biggest producers of synthetic industrial diamonds. So, so that's a very big industry. Yeah, just to maybe to provide one comment on that, um, to, just for context. So the Chinese are the largest producer of synthetics. They've been for decades now. Most of that synthetic diamonds produced for, say, industrial construction, um, mining, you know, application. It's that abrasive application, and you know, the, the Chinese produce anywhere from ten to twelve billion carats of, of synthetic for that industrial application annually. And you know, natural diamond production, say, like we, you know, if you look at, you know, my, my charts from before, say, one hundred and twenty million carats. You know, 40 of that's gem quality, you know, 20% near gem and 40% and, and of that's industrial. So I think if we're looking at just the, 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 the supply volume um, of, of synthetic versus natural, it kind, of, it kind of really speaks for yourself. And I think you can kind of see where, uh, you know, the supply of, of lab diamond jewelry 
potentially could get at some point in the future if we look at you know what the supply of of industrial grade diamond is right now and uh, the capacity to to produce that is is just enormous.